Good morning. It's Saturday. This is KSQD Santa Cruz. K-Squid 90.7 FM and streaming at ksqd.org. This is In the Garden, your Saturday morning garden show with Joe Truscott and me, Stephen E. Pop. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. It's a chilly, chilly day in the neighborhood, but boy, it's bright and sunny and, and shiny outside, isn't it? Uh, I just can't wait to get out in that garden. I, I absolutely Absolutely. As soon as it dries out a little bit, <laughs> oh. it's pretty spongy out there in in the world. In, in the world, it's spongy and wet, and there's still slick roads and flowing rivers and creeks and high tides and yeah. lots of driftwood. So be safe out there. Folks. Absolutely, be careful. So, Joe, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about greenhouses today, ah. and you know, I have such a marginal knowledge of greenhouses. And in talking with Stephen uh, over the past several weeks, uh, he has an extensive background in uh, commercial greenhouses and true, work, true. growing plants in greenhouses. And so I thought we would uh, just sort of cover the gamut. But let's uh, let's start with okay. the commercial ones first. Well, and sure. I mean, I've I've worked in in horticulture in in greenhouse uh, well for thirty three plus years in horticulture, and twenty seven of those years have been uh, in greenhouse nursery operations. Mm-hmm. The smallest operation was probably less than an acre. That was my own. Biggest one was four hundred and sixty plus acres of which 50 acres were under glass as they say or under cover so wow. 50 acres that's 2 million 200 thousand square feet of greenhouse space mm-hmm. and there are all kinds of of different greenhouses and different things that can be grown uh, in greenhouses, I've I've grown in my career more than a thousand species of different plants, and uh, of that, more than half of those uh, were grown under cover. And whether that's cut flowers, potted colors such as chrysanthemums or poinsettias, hydrangeas, uh, vegetable crops, herb crops, um, uh, you name it. Really. Yeah, yeah. And and so there are things that uh, do really well, and and there are reasons for. Uh, using a greenhouse, and then there are times when you don't necessarily want to use a greenhouse. I, I'm going to try and cover a, a bunch of topics here regarding uh, the ins and outs and the what's and how's and the why's. But first, I thought it might be interesting just to give a little bit of history. Um, the earliest recorded uh, uh, incident of some kind of greenhouse being used was back in AD 14 under the Roman Emperor Tiberius, mm-hmm. who he had a daily uh, binge or urge for a type of cucumber-like fruit, and they had to supply <laughs> it for him. So they figured out how to do he it. He went through those cucumbers He a did, lot. baby. I tell you what, he liked them old Tiberius and his cukes. Uh, now, no one seems to know exactly what kind of a greenhouse operation that was. And, and you have to jump way forward uh, to, to Korea in 1450 under the Joseon dynasty. And that's where the first recorded um, uh, construction of a greenhouse uh, is is found. And in fact, the, the Koreans have this method of uh, cooking in these floor pits. Uh, and I forget what they're called, but they're kind of a square pit. Well, they figured out how to cover that, keep it burning. And it was the first probably incident of bottom heat uh, heating uh, for a structure. And the the light entered in through paper windows that had probably been greased with animal fat. Right, right. And they were able to grow plants. Um, again, not sure what they were growing. Now, if you go all the way forward to 17th century, uh, the Netherlands and England, that's where your first more or less contemporary type glass houses are, are being created. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one in England... Uh, was in 1681, and it was a greenhouse at the uh, Chelsea uh, Physic Garden growing medicinal plants. And it was the first uh, known heated greenhouse. They had a steam boiler fed with coal, Mm -hmm. uh, which did not help the air outside the greenhouse much, but it kept it warm. And again, they grew medicinal plants. 
Jump forward to 1737 and a wealthy Boston merchant, Andrew Fanuli, uh, introduced the first greenhouse to the United States, to America, and George Washington. We weren't quite the United States in 1737, but Mm -hmm. George Washington, uh, he built uh, a greenhouse on this design at Mount Vernon, and he he grew pineapples in it to serve Uh to his guests. That was... I I was going to say pineapple was was sort of the vogue plant exotic plant of, you, and of you see the it period. you see the design in furniture and oh, in yeah, ceramics in, in ceramics and, and fonts yeah, and all these different uh, yeah filials yeah. on top of uh-huh. uh you know urns and things and then of course uh later in the 1700s uh, at the palace of versailles uh you had the famous uh orangeries where they mm-hmm. grew all of these citrus in big pots and then during the winter time they would wheel them in to the orangery uh greenhouse situation to get them through the winter so it's it's been going on for a while um without a doubt now one of the things that i encounter a lot in my work uh especially in my my garden consultation work i run into clients who and just a lot of gardeners in general who kind of believe that having a greenhouse in your garden is like uh the piece de resistance it's the yeah. you know you've got to have one but they don't know why and the question I always ask them is, why do you want to have a greenhouse? What do you want to do with it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are different things you can do. You can do propagation work in it. You can, uh, you know, you, whether it's seeds or cuttings of, uh, to get a jump on the season. You can grow tropical plants, obviously, or other plants that are, you know, not acclimated to your local climate. Um, you can, uh, do what's called forcing of flowering plants. And this is part of what I did commercially for many uh-huh. years, uh-huh. getting a, a flowering plant to bloom outside of its normal cycle. And uh, let me interrupt you mm-hmm. and just say, where, did, how did you, I understand the forcing part of it, but clearly you would have to get the tulips bulbs from somewhere, right? So- sure. So whether it was tulips or lilies is a real good example of uh-huh. how uh, we would order crates of lilies uh, months in advance. We would usually start in the summertime placing our orders with Dutch growers in the Netherlands. Uh-huh. And whether it was the uh, oriental lilies, the big ones like the stargazer that so many uh-huh. people are familiar with, or the Casablancas, or the, uh, uh, the Asiatic lilies, or the L.A. hybrid lilies, which is a Longifolia Asiatic uh, hybrid, the Longifolia being the uh, typical Easter lily, they would uh, take your orders and send them out to the farmers. And then when it was time to lift those bulbs from the fields, and you, you really hoped that they weren't frozen in or they didn't have too wet of a fall because that uh-huh. could delay your shipments, they would lift those, they would f- clean them, freeze them uh, in crates, and then put them on ships and send them over to us. And we would then get them off of trucks, and they would be delivered to a cold storage facility. And at that time, I was working in Salinas. Yeah. So we bring those uh, to our facility and put them in our cooler where they thaw slowly. Uh, and then we would plant them in uh, succession in – we would actually use the lily crates themselves as, as growing containers, put a planting medium in. And then we put them in what we called the damp room or the cool room. And we would get them just to sprout, just to begin to sprout. And we would hold them in this cool environment. It was like mm-hmm. an early dormant spring situation. Mm-hmm. And then as we needed them each week – We'd pull out a green, usually about a greenhouse full. I used used to grow like twelve greenhouses full. Uh, those were two hundred foot long uh, by thirty foot wide greenhouses. So what's that? Six hundred square, six thousand right. square feet. Uh, now, now, for something like this, you would act. You would definitely know how long it took mm-hmm. from that little bit of growth, early growth, correct, 
until you put them on the shelf and then they were and ready to be carted a, off to and then to initiate a bloom you had so many weeks and you had a and feeding schedule palm and, sunday they were out everywhere that's so. it that's it yeah no and and you know there were colors for seasons and mm. uh you know you would you would have to time it all out fortunately the Dutch growers had done a lot of the background work for us already in terms of the timing, saying this one is going to take you 12 weeks, this one's going to take you 13 weeks. And so, they speak in weeks? Is that correct? More or less. More or weeks. less. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And it, it varies for different types of crops. So, like, you know, a snapdragon, uh, then you had seasonal periods, and it was in months, and you had your winter one, winter two, yeah. spring one, spring two, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. on and on. So yeah, that's that's forcing uh, flowers, and, uh, and, and we're we're talking about constructing uh, greenhouses too. I'm mm-hmm, very curious mm-hmm. because for those big commercial greenhouses, they're they're a frame, right? Let, let's Correct. talk about what the facility is. It, it's a frame, but so, then the the pictures that I know most were growing orchids and stuff, and mm-hmm. they were always on tables. They were not okay, on the so ground. So that, that brings up the next point, is that when you're talking about what are you going to use your greenhouse for, it's important to say, well, what am I going to grow and how am I going to grow it? I grew inside greenhouses directly in the soil when I was doing cut flowers, and and there are those who will grow uh, food crops as well, uh, in directly in the ground, uh, inside the inside a greenhouse. greenhouse. Yeah, okay. so that means there's no covering on the floor. It's soil. You've actually usually brought a tractor in and turned that soil and put in your amendments, and you've taken a bed shaper over it. If it's a 200 foot by 30 foot wide tube, you probably or, or hoop house type situation, you probably uh, had, had a tractor in there with a bed shaper and could get five or six beds at about uh, 24 uh, inches wide uh, each. In okay, there. ladies and gentlemen, we've just taught you a new word, vernacular, <laughs> bed shaper. Bed shaper. Now, you sort of, you know, tattoo that in your mind, <laughs> bed shaper, because... Yeah, it's how you make a bed to plant in. It's <laughs> it's an implement uh, put on the back of a tractor, so. And it makes a perfectly edged and and smooth topped uh, uh, planting situation. So sure. So there's planting directly into the soil. Then there's planting on top of the ground where you're probably going to have put down some form of a floor treatment, some kind of a floor covering. Usually a um, uh, like a weed barrier cloth mm-hmm. or something like that. You want it to be water permeable, obviously. Right. Um, and sometimes if you have a more permanent situation and you're either going to grow on top of the ground or on benches that have to be installed, mm-hmm. um, then you're going to have possibly a gravel floor, uh, at, at least mm-hmm. drain rock to at least two inches in depth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. there are pluses and minuses, pros and cons to all of those sorts of treatments. So yeah, to answer your question in a roundabout way, depends what you were planning to grow. Mm-hmm. And rarely will you see combinations of these things in a single house. It's going to be one or the other. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. From from entrance door until to the rest. But mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. if people looked at um, the Facebook announcement that we that we put out, um, that was an orchid nursery, and I was telling uh, Stephen how how it had everything in it if you look at the at the greenhouse itself right. it it had windows that would automatically open and close based on temperature and heat it had fans that would start blowing again based mm-hmm. on temperature mm-hmm. it um it had a sprinkler system in it to mist the orchis uh, the orchids it had a a shade that pulled across mm-hmm. the top that would also shade the orchids. but um, So you're hitting on all the points here, and, and these are the important factors to consider uh, affecting the design and the materials that you might want to use if you're going to create mm-hmm. a greenhouse situation in your yard. And, you know, one of the main factors we had to look at was light. Uh, how much will you need to grow uh, what you want to produce and light was measured in candle foot is how we did it. we had these mm-hmm. candle foot meters and <clears throat> excuse me but um basically uh if you don't have enough light you might want to have to bring in artificial lighting grow lights that sort of thing which mm-hmm. is an electrical aspect mm-hmm. heat 
uh, will you need to maintain? And there's really no reason to put in uh, a heating unit, a heater into your greenhouse unless what you're growing needs to maintain a constant day and night temperature throughout the life of the crop. So how, how are you going to do that with gas, electric, steam? We used a lot of steam in the greenhouses, steam lines, steam pipes, uh-huh. uh, steam generated heat that was blown into plastic tubes that ran down the length of the greenhouse and then through Whoa. holes. Um, and those those heating bills get <laughs> quite big very, I say you'd very have, quickly. You'd have to have a boiler room. You on. would, and yeah. we did. We had, in fact, one of the operations when I was growing poinsettias and, and chrysanthemums, etc., our boiler room, the boilers we had were the boil, two boilers, these massive things that had been in the bellies of – Liberty ships in the Second World War no that kidding. had sailed across the ocean oh and my back, goodness. and there they were. They ran on natural gas or on fuel oil. Uh-huh. So we would watch the spot markets to see what was going to be cheaper. Our our heating bill in the winter time when we were doing points point studies was fifty five thousand dollars a month uh-huh. uh, just on natural gas. And then if you had something go wrong with these things, there was only one crew of people that we knew who could work on these things anymore. And they were called San Jose Boiler. And and the guy's logo on their T-shirts was a steam engine, a steam locomotive. (laughs) So, I mean, and and if those things ever – oh, I shouldn't say this, but if those things ever blew, uh, you'd really want to be in a different time zone. Uh, Right. They're going to go. Oh, my. Yeah. The the, – I mean, when you start thinking about the expenses going into a greenhouse, and especially for for plants that are so holiday specific, right? Yeah, you no, gotta yeah. sell. You gotta hope there's a whole lot of people who are interested in giving away poinsettias. <laughs> well, yeah, it's an amazing thing. Nobody ever wanted one on January second. I don't yeah. know why. Yeah. So a- yeah, I mean, so that's. Another consideration, then, we talk about heat. What about cooling? Uh, you mentioned it earlier. A greenhouse can get mighty hot during oh, the day. Yeah. If, it's, if it's 80 degrees and sunny outside in the middle of summer, it could be 110, 120 yeah. inside your greenhouse. So how are you going to cool? And usually it, you, uh, those things are located not on along the coast, but further inland and flat areas. Precisely. And it gets really hot. Really, really hot. So, okay, uh, well, options for cooling. I mean, we had in some of our houses, especially in our huge 40,000-square-foot propagation unit, we had uh, swamp coolers, you know, those old things that drain water Mm -hmm. over a screen and then a fan blows. You can use fans to get the air moving, but that by itself is not always going to be enough. Some some specialty growers, like those that grow freesias, they need to keep – the bulbs cold uh, in the soil so they will run uh, copper tubing with cold water refrigerated water through the soil beds through the planting beds you know (sighs) just all sorts of fascinating things but let's face it the easiest way is and this is also very very important for controlling humidity which is another topic altogether uh, cooling is usually generally accomplished through the use of ventilation. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned it. There are different types of venting uh, setups. You can have what's called the top vent. You can have a sidewall vent where the walls of your greenhouse either roll down mm-hmm. and up or lift out. Or you can have what's called end wall venting, where you either have louvers at the top of each end and you've got uh, airflow that's pushing the hot air out and dragging cool air in from one direction to the other, Mm -hmm. uh, or just opening up the doors. It's all dependent upon the size. And the taller your greenhouse is, the taller the roof is, uh, the greater the differential of both temperature and humidity you're going to have inside of a greenhouse. The, uh, humidity levels usually sink, right? So, it's, so it's warm air more... holds moisture okay. and cool air uh, lets go of it. So when you start to get that exchange, you can actually have it rain inside of your greenhouse if you open a vent too quickly. And we even had uh, instances when I was growing cut flower roses 
where we would have our vents up on a hot day, but then a hot wind would blow in through the vent and come down and fry the the blooms oh. inside the house. Uh, so there, there's all of these different considerations, these environmental control. And as you mentioned, all of these things can be hooked up to computers and sensors and be done automatically. But what I learned was even though I might have four houses on a single computer controlling the side vents and the humidity or the overhead sprinklers, if I was, if I was using misting, um, they would screw up. You never walk away. Yeah, yeah. You, you learn never to walk away. You never trust it just because it's a computer. You, it, you know, if you're not there, you don't know. Mm-hmm. What's going on? Mm-hmm. And and the um, the commercial use of of greenhouses has evolves with the market, doesn't it? I mean, the um, the couple of greenhouses I visited. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were there are some people may not know this. There are some greenhouses in Santa Cruz, Monterey County where you can barely see the horizon mm-hmm. through them. Mm-hmm. It is one, it was ranges one connected lo- ranges exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're talking about not a couple of hundred plants. We're talking millions. Millions. Absolutely. No, in fact when uh, again I'll harken back. Well, the the two largest places that I worked, uh one is a specialty cuts uh grower for Matsui Nursery who's now all orchids. Mm-hmm. We had some uh, very large ranges that were connected and also when I worked for McCann Floral uh in uh, Watsonville, Pajaro area, growing poinsettias, mm-hmm. chrysanthemums, uh hydrangeas and some other specialties. We had we we called them ranges. So you might have ten greenhouses uh, connected, and on each side of the walkway that went down the middle of the range, you had a ten thousand square foot greenhouse to your left, to your right, and they might have been separated by walls inside. Not always, but they they uh, always were connected, so you could continue to work in all kinds of weather. Right. Right. And they also, I, I would, just thinking of it now, it wasn't always on f- totally flat land. There's usually a slope mm-hmm. somewhere. Mm-hmm. So yeah, when I was at so you'd go up, so yeah, each greenhouse would go would be up. a tier, a, a yeah. level up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which could make it very interesting uh, sometimes when it came to irrigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's another thing we have to, we have to talk about and think about is um, – what are your irrigation options? Well, again, it's crop dependent. Uh, do you want to or can you use overhead sprinklers uh-huh. over your crop or will that damage the crop? Can you uh, or should you use uh, some form of a uh, – we would run a line in, uh, say, on a bench or a table and had then have – spaghetti lines coming off of that with an emitter or a bubbler that would go into each pot or to each plant. Mm. Uh, so that's a lot. I mean, we had crews that did nothing but work on irrigation and constantly go through every greenhouse checking to see were any of those emitters clogged oh and having gosh. to replace and repair yeah, them. Yeah, so yeah. a lot of, uh, and then, for something uh, that's more down and dirty, either you're growing in the soil, whether it's a vegetable crop or a, a flower crop, you can use the old drip tape. Uh, so you would run a, a strip of drip tape, and they had laser-drilled holes <clears throat> at varying uh, spacing, 4-inch, 6-inch, 8-inch, and you would have a drip emitter. You can use soaker lines. Mm-hmm. If you're doing a propagation setup where you're starting seeds or you're working with cuttings, uh, generally you're going to have a mister system. So there's all these different types of of uh, emitters that will put out, uh, you know, a gallon per minute, a gallon per hour, uh, you know, half a gallon, whatever. You have timers set up that come on every 30 seconds, every minute, right, every right. hour, whatever it might be. Uh, to keep things down, but every plant has its own watering requirements. Mm. 
So you have to match that up. And, and at, at different times as well, I would think. There are times sure. when if you, you really have to cut back on the water, cut back on the nutrients because – you wouldn't want them just like in your own garden. You don't want them to green tomato bushes six feet high and no fruit. I exactly. Mean, so. And that brings up another interesting point, which I was going to save till later, but now that you've brought it up about growing vegetable crops undercover. Hmm. Um, I, I had a friend who had a rose growing operation out on Casterly Road. And uh, he leased out a few of his houses um, to an individual who wanted to grow tomatoes undercover. Great idea, beautiful plants. Only problem was there was no fruit because there were no pollinators. There was nothing getting in. All of his vents were screened. So he took the screening off, and that didn't work. And then he went to one of the local insectary folks who produce these beneficial insects, which, by the way, if you have a completely enclosed greenhouse situation, it's a great way to go totally pesticide-free using all natural predators. Yeah. And he bought what were called bumblebee boxes. I've used these before, too. Well, he set them up very dutifully, and then it got hot, and he opened his vents, and all the bumblebees flew out and went to the mustard field next door. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, these things, it's it's not a precise science. Yeah. But I I know a lot of backyard gardeners would like to grow tomatoes and peppers and eggplants through the winter months, and you can. Uh, I grow peppers. Uh-huh. Uh, but you do need to to either hand pollinate them or to and there are ways of doing that yeah, uh, yeah. or or have a pollinator in there so you're letting things in and you're letting warm air out and oh, not many bees fly on a cold winter day no they don't no so, especially uh, if it's raining yeah <laughs> no i it, it's such a, a a precarious business and yet it's done so it, it's so important to the agricultural com, um, It's made a huge difference in providing commodities that exactly. would otherwise be unavailable or that had to be shipped in from uh, a, a more warmer southern clime, for instance, when you're out of season. So right, right. It really has become it, – it is a profitable industry, but it is also a difficult uh, one uh-huh. to maintain. You have to know what you're doing, and you have to have the energy and knowledge to – Pull it off. Yeah. So okay. let's let's um, maybe think just a little bit about um, you know what materials are going to be used and how they affect some of those factors. The first thing to think about is, um, and you mentioned this before, is uh, what is the structure itself going to be made out of? What is the frame going to be? And this. In, in the industry, it's almost always going to be a steel frame or mm-hmm. an alloy frame. Um, they're heavy, uh, but they're structurally very sound. They have to be put together by somebody who knows what they're doing. You can also use wood, uh, which would have to be a rot-resistant wood like redwood or cedar. And even then, you're going to be exposing it to moisture over a long period of time. Yeah. So, you know, you may end up having to redo that. And then the the more down and dirty method that we'll talk about a little bit in the next half of the show is using uh, PVC pipe to mm-hmm. create hoop houses, which is, you know, it's lightweight, it's structural. You can use aluminum. There are aluminum piping kits, but those guys, you have to be very careful about making sure that they're anchored down well. Otherwise, they'll blow away. Um, oh, boy. And I've actually seen a 200-foot greenhouse lifted into the air by a small tornado that we had once in uh, South Salinas. Oh. And it picked it up, spun it around, and set it on top of another greenhouse. So, yeah, proper anchoring is an important factor. Who, who would have thought here on the uh, Central Coast? That's, a, yeah. that's an issue. Well, it's the, we weren't in Kansas then, but we are now, so... Well, we're going to take a, a brief little break here, and we'll come back and we'll talk more about this, uh, this topic. All right. All right.
Oh. And we're back. All right. <laughs> Here comes the sun, Here folks. Here comes the sun, it indeed. It is up and shining, and uh, I tell you, this is... Uh, everywhere you look now, it's green. It's green, green, green. So uh, cold, but green. Yeah, yeah. We were uh, we were talking uh, with Martin Quigley uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about the Mediterranean climate. And he said, mm-hmm. "It this is now springtime, and it this is. is now you know the season for things to be in bloom." And later that day, I went home, and my rosemary was absolutely covered in flowers. Uh, so. Nice. Anyway, we're nice. gonna we're still talking about greenhouses yeah. right here on KSQD Santa Cruz. I'm with Stephen Pop. I'm Joe Truscott, and uh, we're having a great time talking about things that uh, you may or may not know, even though you drive by greenhouses all the time. That's so. right, and you know, quite obviously, you can't look in. They're uh, they're not much covered in glass anymore. Yeah, and, and many people don't want you in there. Their insurance. Oh my God, doesn't allow you to be wandering around in their greenhouses. No, it doesn't. And, and I was told, I, having been thrown out of, uh, <laughs> of a color spot greenhouse in Salinas, oh, well. you don't belong here. Um, I said, you know, I love plants. What could I do? Uh, <laughs> we used to get a couple of those now and again. but uh, This yeah. is not open. You're not, this is not a place to tour, he said. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, well, we were, we were talking about the construction and the different materials materials used and um, you know after you do have a frame in place you've got to cover it with something so there are different choices <clears throat> now in the old days we had glass mm-hmm. hence the term growing under glass yeah these were panes of glass well panes of glass falling from a 30 foot or a 20 foot ceiling can be very painful oh. and ruin your day yeah and in earthquake country i've worked inside glass houses here in california in monterey county i never and thought of that went through an earthquake one time and one and while i was watching the concrete floor or the or, uh, aisle uh, look like a wave motion panes of glass were crashing down oh you're kidding and it was not a pretty sight so therein glass can last for a while it doesn't break down in sunlight, but it needs reglazing, and it's subject to coming loose. So oh. there's upkeep on it. What do you mean glazing? That's the putty that goes in around the edges to hold oh, it okay. in its frame. And so. do they actually paint the glass, too, or is it colored glass? No, it's clear glass, and what you're talking about is shading compound, and, and mm-hmm. we'll, we'll touch bases on that here in a little while. That's okay. why most of the greenhouses have a certain amount of shading on them, because full direct sunlight can be too intense. Yeah, they seem to have a, a similar color all over. Yeah, um, it's it's white, <laughs> generally speaking. Uh-huh. So the other use is um, and was <clears throat> the, probably one of the great saviors in terms of cost was the use of, although not great for the environment, was polyethylene plastic or just polyplastic. Uh-huh. And in the early days, sheets of polyplastic, were very subject to breaking down in sunlight uh, after just a year or two, so you'd have to replace them. Now they've got them where they'll last three to five or more years, so that helps. Um, But basically, it's lightweight, quick to install, uh, it is easily torn or punctured, and uh, needs to be replaced every five years or so. The other thing about the polyethylene plastic, as well as some of the other types of plastic components that are used, you can get them at varying degrees of opacity. So you can have anything from 85% total light down to only 50% light Uh uh, entering in through that plastic, which can reduce your need to um, apply shading compounds or shade cloths. One of the uh, more recent, by recent I mean probably the 80s, uh, materials that came into use was called uh, polycarbonate. And polycarbonate sheets comes in corrugated sheets like you could go buy at one of your local hardware outlets to put on a little sunroof or something with let light through. Again, Mm -hmm. varying levels of of opacity. But there are... uh, uh, more technical sheets that have been made in four by eight sheets, and some of them are single wall, some of them are double wall. 
and they have great insulating capacity. Uh, they get a little pricier, but they last longer uh, than your plastic. <clears throat> and then lastly, we have this whole line of, of product called thermoplastics, also called cryoacrylic. Those are fancy words for plexiglass uh -huh. uh, or types of plexiglass. And it's the most expensive, but it's got the longest lifespan. It's shatterproof. It's a good insulator. Now, when it comes to the amount of light and shading, the compounds that are used are generally uh, a form. It's like a whitewash, and it can be made from oyster shells. Or it can be made from lime, mm -hmm. and it can be brushed on or sprayed on. Obviously, it will wash off during rains. Yeah, so, yeah. That so is it applied inside the house? On the outside. Oh. On the outside. And you either send a crew up on the roof to roll it on or slosh it on, or you get a sprayer now, and spray it on. I have a question. Being a curious mind... Okay, the glass starts breaking, you got to replace it. But you can't walk on a roof like that because <laughs> it's glass. <coughs> so, so you 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 do you replace them from the inside or do you how, how do you fix them? Okay. Something? Well, actually um have you ever heard of a chicken ladder? No. Okay, so a chicken ladder the 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 main ridge beam of your greenhouse will be metal or wood. And what they do, and, and so will you'll have a bottom purlon or, or uh, uh, like an eave at the bottom. Uh, 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 on the ground? No, no, on the edge of the roof, on the edge of the oh, roof. Oh, okay. And the ladder has a hook at the top of it, and it's, it goes the entire length of the roof. Um, sometimes, you know, if you have connected greenhouses, you guys are walking in the gutters between the greenhouses, putting the chicken ladder up over the ridge line so it hooks on. And then they climb up that ladder, do their work left and right, and then climb back down, move it over a foot or two, climb back up and down, moving the ladder as they go along the ridge line, repairing the glass. And they're outside? Yes. Oh, so the ridge line is actually above the house. It Correct. runs on the top yeah, of the Yeah, the very house. top of the ridge line, and then you've got all of your framing for the glass coming down. Or it could be, you know... It could also be uh, the polycarbonate material or something like that, which right. occasionally breaks and needs to be replaced. Right, right. Oh, we've got only about 15 minutes left, and I do want to get to home versions sure. because I think that's going to be the, the most relevant to, um, to our listeners mm -hmm. because there are chances for those of you who grow maybe 10, 20 Catalia orchids or something like that mm -hmm. that you really you want to give them nice light but you can't just put them outside so i think one of the most important thing unless you are a, a collector or growing specialty plants um, and orchids would be one in particular uh -huh. Uh, the most common use of greenhouses is generally to get plants started early oh. and get them out for the spring uh -huh. and be able to uh, get that jump, you know. The extra heat allows the seeds right. to germinate. So if you're starting yeah. your tomatoes and your peppers in January, late January or, or right now or right. early February, then they're already four or five inch plants ready to be hardened off, set out mm -hmm. in the springtime and you get that jump. On the right, season. right. So, here we go. What kind of a greenhouse do you want? You can buy a hobby kit, mm -hmm. uh, pre pre done kit. There is a great uh, local uh, establishment business. They've been here since 1979 in in the Watsonville area called System USA. Uh, they work. I've worked with them on a professional basis, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but they will do design work for you as well as. Uh, sell you kits, or you can just buy the components from them. Mm -hmm. They've got everything. Um, you can go online, and there's a uh, an outfit called Farm Tech, and Farm Tech has all kinds of different options for the professional or the backyard gardener. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's Shelter Logic, and Shelter Logic, <clears throat> they're a little on the lower end, but they've got some cheaper stuff that works adequately, or you can. DIY it. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite construction designs 
is using a Schedule 80 PVC pipe. That's the gray pipe. And I would buy – now I would do my, my hoop houses is what we're going to construct here um, in eight-foot sections. So I would buy the 20-foot length of uh, Schedule 80. I'd use inch and a half mm-hmm. generally for the diameter pipe. And I would cut them in half into 10-foot lengths. And let's say I wanted to have a 16-foot long house, two 8-foot sections. So I would buy enough pipe to do that. I'm going to have the pipe that arches over. And then I'm going to have a pipe that runs down the top in a ridge line. I'm going to use T connectors. And and this is irrigation pipe that we're talking about here. So you would go to an irrigation supply store uh, that sells PVC pipe. Now, the reason I'm using the Schedule 80 and not the gray is that the white Schedule 40, there's even a thinner one, Schedule 20, which I would never work with, um, it breaks down very quickly uh, in light. Uh-huh. But the Schedule 80 does not. Yeah. So uh, I've got my two 10-foot lengths uh, for each side of my hoop. I've got a connector, a T connector at each end, and a four-way connector in the middle. I get myself four to, let's see, for be three on each side for a 16-foot house, uh, construction stakes. That's a metal stake, or you could use rebar. You would cut it to about a foot and a half, 18 inches to 24 inches. You would mark out where your your uh, points were for the uh, uh, the outline of your greenhouse, drive those stakes in, leaving about a foot above surface, <clears throat> put one end of the pipe over it, get somebody to help you, bend it down, hook it in to the connector, and do it the same on the other side. And then run the middle ridge pipe uh, in the same way using those connectors, setting each. You've got three bows now for a 16-foot house. Take a piece uh, of 16-foot long uh, uh, redwood or cedar uh, board that is one inch by six inches or two by six, your choice, to put as a footer. You would attach that along the ground on the outside of these pipes because you're going to attach your plastic to that. Mm -hmm. Get your roll of polyurethane after you've got the pipe set up and roll it over. And you could use uh, zip ties to tie it down, put a piece of tape over the hole uh, when you puncture the plastic. Mm -hmm. And you can either leave the ends open or... Uh, you put on an extra length of plastic, just you know, stretch it out that much further uh, to have as a covering over the ends. Or you could put your own end wall on with a door using corrugated polycarbonate or whatever you wanted to use. And voila, you have a little greenhouse structure. It does not have a vent. So mm-hmm. your only vent is going to be the doorway or the ends. Yeah, yeah. Now, an even older and simpler method is called a cold frame. Mm -hmm. That's a raised bed, um, a a box, and you lift, you add on, uh, on one side of your raised bed or box, uh, another width uh, to give it height. And then you connect a frame on top with hinges that can either be plastic or glass. uh, And you can Unheated, but still you can get that Mm -hmm. start in your Mm -hmm. box by covering it. Also, polytunnels have become very, very popular with a lot of growers. And that's the same design I just described for your greenhouse, but it's just a smaller hoop that covers a bed with polyurethane plastic Mm -hmm. uh, to keep things safe through the frost and and through the night. Remember, you got to open them up to let your pollinators in. It's what they do with a lot of the berry growths, right? The raspberries. Raspberries in particular. Hoop houses. Yeah, those are are hoop houses. Uh, They're they're full walk-in polytunnels. And all that they're really getting is maybe three degrees difference, and that's all it takes to keep that crop growing. Yeah. Yeah. And producing. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, those are pretty lightweight and easy, quick to install. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, I guess it would also be possible if even if you have a wall, you could get some um, plastic, some polyurethane. Absolutely. And attach it to the edge of a wall or a house and just figure out a way of 
propping it up so that part of it is just a little covered. So you create your own little warmer spot. A lot of folks have created a solarium type setting mm-hmm. off of a room and even have a door from the house going in and it's a great way to add additional heat into the house. You do want to be able to vent it somehow in case the humidity grows right. uh, to too right. high a level. Uh, when I used to do remodel construction I was an apprentice carpenter for three years and we used to get all kinds of materials off of jobs when we had done demos. Mm-hmm. Windows, doors with glass, and I've assembled more than one impromptu glass house yeah, just yeah. using pieces and putting right. them on a frame. Right, and, right. And it's, it's great, great fun, and it's a nice reuse yeah. uh, kind of a situation. Now, I, I also have uh, had friends that got these greenhouses that were one solid unit. Uh-huh. And that, you know, you, you had to have a bed of a truck that would deliver it. Sure. But it was maybe... Oh, 12 feet by 8 feet mm-hmm. by 8 feet. Sure. And it was a, it was like a doghouse kind of. Yep. One big piece of thing, but it was uh, fiberglass, so it, mm-hmm. it was light inside, but uh, it, it had maybe a couple of small vents, but that gave them enough of a start to have... Things like um, tomatoes yeah. growing for oh, their own. Oh, it's a own great gut. way to go. And yeah. you know, cost ranges on these things. You can you you start in the several hundreds of dollars, and you end up going into the thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the nicer prefab kits uh, run around five grand usually. You know, mm-hmm. and that's a that's a fairly decent sized house that but that you can work. These with. were kind of like. But I know the ones the, you're, yeah, the the ones mo- you're talking about. The mobile home the, equivalent of yeah, or, a greenhouse. Or the, the child's playhouse. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Just gone, gone crazy. Gone, gone uh, greenhouse. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but what, whatever people, whatever you do, um, be careful and and, uh, and and the biggest caveat also is remember if you are putting electrical into your greenhouse, whether it's to run your vents or your mister system, your timer system, if it's not battery operated and you're bringing in live wires, please exercise caution. Know that if you're not using an electrician that you need to know what you're doing and have water safe and well grounded yeah. uh, you know uh, yeah. equipment going in to a damp environment. I remember going into a greenhouse constructed by someone who did not know what they were doing, and people were nearly being electrocuted because of the types of outlets that they had put in. Oh my goodness! For the yeah, bottom yeah, feet. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we, you know, it was so. Yeah, and you know, I mean, there. I've seen some pretty clever designs. I saw one where they uh, had hooked their water heater up to the propagation house so that they could run tubing on top of the bench to yeah. get bottom heat for yeah. propagation. So it's, it's, it's almost an endless thing. Yeah. But it's, um, when I, I do want to talk uh, a little bit about garden windows. Um, yeah, yeah. When I uh, re- revamped my um, kitchen or had it totally remodeled, I put in a garden window. And I, that has brought me so much joy. And it's just two shelves, and they're glass. <laughs> and I know I'm going to break the shelf at some point. I know that that sh- that shelf is coming down. Or, or Andy will uh, break it. Oh yeah. yeah, right, my cat. But uh, <laughs> although he doesn't go up there, it's a little bit too close to the uh, sink. Okay. But uh, the <laughs> yeah the uh, the other things. I, I, I'm sort of pushing the limit of that tempered glass that goes across yeah. there. But yeah. I tell you, it's been so much fun to have that all that extra sunlight in your kitchen. I love and, those windows. Yeah, the yeah. greenhouse windows. And these uh, does yours have a little vent at the top? Also, it has two so little ones on side the side. Vents. Okay, yeah. yeah, great. And and uh, it's great. And any uh, a lot of the uh, the succulents and cactus that are not are tender, or they're delicious to snails. So I right. have to bring them in. My right. Sansevieria. I mean, it's yep. mother mother in law's tongue. Mm-hmm. One of the easiest things ever grown. Probably one of the first plants I've ever grown. The snails absolutely adore it. Uh, they just yeah, love chewing yeah. it to death. 
Well, there, you know, greenhouses do uh, have their pest issues. And, oh, we didn't you know, talk about we, pesticides. We didn't, right? yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, the the main thing that you need to look out for, especially in a propagation situation, is fungus gnats and any type of uh, floor treatment that you have that isn't permeable enough. Some some houses are concrete, for instance. You build up algae, you start getting fungus gnats. Fungus gnats bore into the tender shoots oh, wow. and devour the plants. Leaf miner yeah. is another one, if uh, which is more cosmetic than actually killing the plant. But for commercial growers, they it can't ruin it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it was a bane of uh, chrysanthemum growing. Yeah. So and all the standard, you know, uh, suspects, you know, spider mites and uh, uh, aphids and white flies. One of the real benefits is that most insects become uh, immobile above eighty degrees. So if you get it hot enough, they yeah. stop. Uh, uh, the, the, exactly. No the uh, I, I'd mentioned before I was thrown out of a color spot uh, greenhouse, and uh, the reason that really got me sending is. Sir, we just gassed this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I said, that's why you can't go in. I said, I'm out of here. Well, there's supposed to be a <laughs> sign on the door to let you know that fact, but if you're not looking for it, you wouldn't I, know. I was already trespassing. Yeah, so. <laughs> not a good place to All be. right, well, Stephen, thank you so much. It's been really informative. We, I feel like we only scratched the surface. We can talk about it more in the future, but uh, it's been fascinating uh, for me to reminisce. Thank you very much. And, you're you're uh, very welcome. You know, shoot me uh, an email or... Or a uh, go to my uh, uh, Facebook page, Green Tiger Garden, if you have any questions. And next week we have a hydrologist coming cool. to talk about water. Water. Hello. Water. All right, folks. All right. Well, Thanks folks, so much for listening. Have a great week.